We're talking about collaboration, aren't we? And we've got sort of um, <coughs> logo bingo there, various organisations involved. I can't go through all of them and what they do in this time. And I realise there's uh, very important people missing as well who don't have logos because um, we can all get together in our organisations and talk about what we should be doing. But when you actually have tracked vehicles out on the grounds doing groundworks, you need to have spoken to the people who are operating that as well. And uh, hopefully, as part of um, the Exmoor Myers partnership, that is built into our processes to ensure that when the actual groundworks happen, those people are collaborating with, with what we're doing. Um, so, Exmoor, Exmoor National Park, tucked away in the southwest there, across um, Devon and Somerset. Um, in, the, we, uh, in recent years, it's uh, taken on its own HER, which has made the job simpler, but in the past, it had to take elements from Devon and uh, Somerset, which had, had issues of its own. And um, the close-up map there, the green bit in the middle, was until 1815, a royal forest, and it, which actually belonged to the Crown. It wasn't simply under forest law. It uh, belonged to the Crown estate and had never been enclosed uh, had not been, well, about 100 acres of, of it had been, and it was a wide open area of moorland. Um, and in addition, so a lot of our work has been in that area, and there were other bits of moorland around that. Um, in the 19th century, these gentlemen, the Knights, uh, very faded line drawing of John Knight, that's because it's the only drawing of him that exists, um, and then his son, they... Um, bought the Royal Forest, it was sold off um, 20,000 hectares, probably the biggest um, single estate in, outside of Scotland that they could have laid their hands on in Britain, and also sort of a blank canvas, this open, unenclosed moorland. And uh, what they set out to do is improve it in, in their view. And I think you can pick up there these um, Lines you can see actually marked out by our work were drains. There are hundreds of kilometres of these drains, in some cases placed just tens of kilometres apart, cut through the peat and through the iron pan underneath it to drain it. Felt to be a great idea at the time perhaps, but with certain implications. Um, so you can see here... The one top right, that would have started as a little drain, probably less than a metre deep when it was first cut. It's not unusual to find them eroding out in places two, three, there's probably some four or five metres deep now. So enormous amount of erosion. The peat up there, top left, drying out. And of course for us as archaeologists, we're particularly worried about all the lovely bits of pollen and other bits of uh, ecological evidence being lost through that. Um, Bottom left, I think, just about shows a series of drains, all of them starting to erode out at the base there. And uh, the other slide over there is the landscape you get when you drain that moorland. It's millennia. It's a uh, purple moor grass. Um, terrible for grazing. Not very interesting ecologically. It's uh, talked about as the white moor sometimes. And you go out there and it's... Uh, for something that's in a national park, it's perhaps not the most exciting and diverse landscape. And also, as I said, pretty terrible for agriculture as well. For maybe a couple months a year, it's actually uh, uh, edible for mo most grazing animals. So, uh, Myers Restoration. And that's been going on uh, since, I think, the beginning of the century. And it was first started out just by the national park on the land that it's owned. It was taken on by the... Uh, Myers uh, Project and now the Myers Partnership, which in a large part has been funded by Southwest Water. Because apart from those uh, sort of images we've seen of erosion and whatever, that has a great impact downstream. All that soil, all that peat is ending up in the rivers. That's uh, having to be purified for drinking water. And uh, there's also, uh, because the moor is no longer acting as a sponge, it will make the rivers uh, very flashy as the expression would be, very low levels in the summer, high levels when it's wet, flooding downstream. And you can't overestimate the sort of costs that's putting on Southwest Water and, and other bodies. So the Myers restoration, I showed you those uh, drains, and it's about 
putting blocks in those drains. Usually a wooden framework in there and then peat piled up against them. Hopefully by the time the wood has rotten away, the peat has taken a grip um, and uh, effort made to do that, although with as minimum impact as possible. Hence, bottom left, the uh, tracked dumper being used to take material out there. And uh, oh, it's not quite clear enough for those of you who are particular spotters of tracked vehicles, but they have extra wide um, tracks put on them and the, the 360 attachment for the bucket, that's very exciting. So there's not too much slewing around, not too much damage. Um, and hopefully the outcome is slide in the middle there that would have been a drain that was running with water but you end up with a series of pools of water spreading out of the peat recovering some lovely moss growing top left there my colleagues are very excited about those low plants as i refer to them and another range of wildlife developing as well a bit of otter sprint as they would call it in, in the bottom there um, as well as the implications you've got biodiversity but as i was talking about hopefully improvement of water quality, reduction of flooding. The archaeology, these are some, those of you who know Exmoor at all will know these very exciting monuments that we've got there. Um, at the right hand side, some of the finest examples of standing stones you'll see on Exmoor, they are referred to as mini lifts. Um, and I assure you, those are large ones, the fact you can actually see them amongst the rush there. And uh, there's a rather lovely cairn, can you see there on the left? I found that one, I'm very pleased with that. Um, and again, quite, so, quite subtle archaeology. I uh, talk to my colleagues on Dartmoor, you know, and say how they basically do archaeology on the easy setting. You know, any fool can find a vast pile of granite, can't we? Um, and obviously very vulnerable to those sorts of groundworks I'm talking about. Those blocks we're putting in, they're being put in maybe every 20 metres, every 10 metres. Ultimately, thousands of those blocks are being installed. And this sort of archaeology could disappear very quickly. Um, so typical of the sort of thing we're doing is firstly, sorting out actually what we've got. That on the left there, that's one site for which we commissioned a walkover survey. Uh, Southwest Water put money up funding this sort of thing. It went from, it had I think nine features on the HER to about 30 after the survey was done, including a, another lovely cairn there. Um, it's actually lower than the, what, the vegetation around it because the vegetation grows differently on the feature, perhaps also because it hasn't had peat developing on the thing itself. But that's about 10 metres across and was unknown until we had a survey done um, last year, I think it was. And that's typical, that increase in the amount of uh, known sites. And then there'll be a restoration plan. So this is what my colleagues want to do, the red line, the outline of the area where they wish to restore uh, mires and wetlands. The yellow lines uh, are ditches. They want to put those blocks in. And then I get hold of it and um, we create these exclusion areas around archaeological features. A lot of those areas, they can't operate at all. The blue, you see there's a few blue lines there. Those are areas where they can do blocking with a watching brief on it, with someone observing what they're doing. Having said that, on Exmoor, and also there's a certain amounts been done on Dartmoor, weeks of watching brief have been done. Nothing's actually been found, but you, you'd say that in those cases they are very close to uh, features. Because this particular area, <laughs> Cods End Moor, you've got um, the LIDAR there showing an enclosure. Oh, I can use my shadows, can I have the shadows of it? Enclosure here, cut through the 19th century ditch. Of course, Victorians, no respecters of archaeology, it was probably a good landmark. Because this is this quite substantial feature here. Um, and also a uh, coaxial field system as well. That's actually lynchited and stuff. All that was unknown until the 1980s, um, and none of it scheduled either. Um, not, various things to do with history of scheduling and whatever, which I'm sure other people here know far better than me. So there's a lot of features like this with no scheduling on them either, but we've been able to take them account and uh, protect them from the restoration process. And that, that gives a, a different view of that. The uh, red circle there, where's the shadow? Oh, 
I don't know. If you can see the red circle, that's the sort of concentrated area of archaeology. The yellow is a bit of mire, and of course that's very exciting for us to get that archaeology, and that field system has multiple phases to it, next to a mire of peat. There's over a metre of peat there. I know it's not very exciting to, for some people, it's good for Exmoor. And um, paleoecological evidence right next to that, five minutes, all good, going back um, uh, over 3,000 years. And of course, restoring that mire is actually improving and preserving that paleoecological evidence. Um, so it's not just about survey. There's been a certain amount of excavation done, geophysics done, um, uh, documentary um, research as well. Um, but sometimes, obviously, we're coming up with conflicts. Peat cuttings here, historical features in their own right. But my colleagues would like to block them. Um, so what can we do about that? How well does that show up? How do you survey tens of hectares of these quite subtle, irregular features. Well, one way we've been trying is photogrammetry, flying drones over it, getting these detailed 3D models. There's the landscapes there. And you can possibly see on this one, part of the issues we've got as well, the very features we're looking at, see these dark patches here, are eroding. So we could say, leave them alone, don't do any groundworks near them, don't try and do any blocking, but they're disappearing anyway. So we've got to make a decision. Is it worth protecting something by leaving it alone to disappear? Um, some problems we have. This was a site where um, surveys were done, a uh, plan was made, and ultimately the, uh, it was a common, which had some commoners. The owner was happy for us to go ahead. The commoners weren't, even though they never grazed there. But there we go. So it didn't happen. There are certain issues. And occasionally... We get it wrong. Um, linear feature here, probably part of the prehistoric field system. These are the tracks where there's been blocking done, which has gone over it. It hasn't been excluded. Um, I'm not going to make excuses. There are reasons. The original HER is perhaps a little bit confusing there. And in fact, the feature was uh, not mapped in the correct place. And there's a picture of it on the ground, taken on Monday. Can you see it clearly there, that feature amongst the millennia? Um, I'm not making excuses, these are reasons. We have to, you know, always try and uh, keep up with that. And part of what we're doing is going out and resurveying those features to improve the HER to get a better record. Um, and here's a little uh, query, a little uh, conundrum. Uh, my colleagues want to block various features here. But this area, Lark Barrow Farm, was a farm made in the 1840s, basically built, the enclosure, drainage done, um, abandoned in the 1850s. So it's a snapshot of this event of 19th century improvement. And the uh, National Park have made it a principal archaeological landscape, one of their own designations. Lark Barrow is especially significant because of the preservation and completeness of the layouts of two night farms, associated infrastructure, field gutters, peat cuttings. The very features for which uh, it's been designated are the features which they want to block. How do we square that circle? Chief Executive's thinking about it. Thank you very much. Um, and just finally, it's not just been all about mitigation. What do we do about these threats? Funding has been put up by Southwest Water as well into varying uh, different fields of research. Um, the soils before the peak was there, Second World War training there, um, tephra have been found, exactly what was going on with the knights, the documentary record to do with their work, and uh, the two at the bottom there is that area, Cod's End Moor, as we speak, there's geophysics, earthwork survey, paleoecological sampling. So it's not simply about uh, trying to mitigate the effects of what's going on, but trying to understand that landscape better and the archaeology of that landscape. Thank you very much.